and thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, a few uh, consistent themes, I guess, uh, with Melissa. But uh, in acknowledging the traditional owners, yeah, I'd really like to um, thank them for the the um, wisdom and the ge generosity that they've shown me in uh, in sharing their knowledge and. Uh, I um, sympathise with a lot of their um, pain and disappointment, the outcome of the recent referendum. So, uh, as Alana said, I was associated with the university, but I'm a little um, kind of uncomfortable about being here. I retired uh, about six months ago, and um, I envisaged that I'd be, you know, kind of... Uh, boating down the river with the Maribyrnong River with Ian, or uh, maybe spending a lot of time, more time w walking in the forest rather than being in rooms talking about them. Um, but uh, I'm also a little uncomfortable because there are voices that have been excluded from this discussion, and uh, I think if we're going to have a genuine discussion and dialogue about the future of Victorian forests, then we need to include all those voices. So one of those voices, uh, I'm here today representing um, Forestry Australia, and uh, let's just see where we are. Forestry Australia is a professional organisation. It's uh, 1,200 members from across Australia, uh, professionals and forest growers who work in all different types of forests, native production forests, conservation forests, plantations, farm forests, and... Um, also a lot of other aspects of natural resource management. So our president is uh, Michelle Freeman, and um, I think she would have been an eminently worthy presenter at, at this event. Um, I also noticed that a lot of the speakers are mostly old white blokes like me, and uh, I think we could have a lot more diverse voices in this discussion. So where are the young, female, ethnically diverse, researchers who have worked studying Victorian forests? Um, where are the early career scientists? Where are the social scientists? Where are all the people who work in the bush, who are in there every day and have that local understanding that La Uncle Larry talked about? Where are the industry whose livelihoods are actually dependent on these decisions? So um, I've talked a little bit about Forestry Australia. I'm not here to defend or... Uh, uh, defend past uh, practices. Many of those practices have changed in response to both new knowledge and also public pressure. And there's been many constraints to change, changing practices and I'll talk a bit about those things. Forestry Australia doesn't support <coughs> the government's decision. We don't believe it was based on sound evidence or good process. It was done without consultation with many of the affected parties and without consultation with the traditional owners. It's their interests that are central to this and it's their land, their forests. So we've had a number of, um, a, a recent conference of Forestry Australia, 500 members gathered uh, in Queensland. Uh, we had a very diverse program. It was fantastic to see a uh, number of, in, um, the leadership and involvement of many Indigenous people in those discussions, people from across uh, many different aspects of forest management plantations, farm forestry, and many others. So um, yeah, we're meeting here at the Royal Society, and I think uh, sort of ironic or perhaps uh, symbolic that uh, it was the takeoff point for the Burke and Wills exploration of Central Australia. Uh, it's, um, yeah, I guess, analogous. We're embarking on a journey, if you like, about what we do with the future of uh, of Victoria's forest, so we all know how this journey ended up. Uh, but really, they were carrying too much baggage. Uh, they had limited experience. Their goals weren't really very clear. Vague goal of reaching somewhere up north, uh, northern Australia. And uh, to a large part, they ignored Indigenous knowledge. So they ended up starving, a bunch of them, uh, in a landscape where people had been living and thriving for thousands of years. So maybe there are some lessons in our journey um, as we go through this talk. So Ian asked me to give a few definitions, and I'll, I'll talk briefly through these. Uh, firstly, forests. What are they? Well, the word actually didn't have anything to do with trees initially. Um, it really meant outside or the land outside the settled areas. Uh, 
and uh, it was a place where, where, which was off limits or excluded. And uh, you know, in Spanish, uh, un forestero isn't um, a forester, it's actually a stranger. So it's someone from outside the local area. Uh, in Latin, attractive land um, covered with trees is called a silva, and that's the origin of our term silver culture. So these outside areas gradually got taken over by the medieval royal families where they ex enjoyed exclusive hunting rights. But many of those areas actually, like our um, traditional owners here, um, contained traditional users of those lands that they were often cultivated, had very few trees. And the early foresters were actually gamekeepers who um, excluded a lot of those traditional uses. So in more recent times, we're defining forests according to more structural characteristics, uh, an ecosystem that's uh, dominated by trees but it consists of many other um, plants and animals. Uh, but these are the FAO definitions. It's, uh, it includes natural and planted forests, intensively managed forest plantations, and uh, in the FAO definition, it, it excludes land that's under agricultural or urban uses. Um, so the Australian definition is slightly different to that, and I won't go into it. But I also want to recognise that trees outside forests are, are very important for many different values. So there's lots of farmland with trees in them, and those trees are very important for conservation and on-farm benefits. Forestry is, a, um, uh, is defined in a broad sense. It's not just cutting down trees. It's the science and craft of creating and managing, conserving forests, and using and caring for our forests. So silviculture is a practice within forestry which applies ecological principles um, to a stand of trees to help meet specified objectives. So there are objectives that can include income, wildlife, habitat, water quality, recreation, or any other values. So we've had some uh, presentation on different values. There's a whole range of um, things that we care about and want from our forests, uh, starting with social and cultural values, particularly those of traditional owners, biodiversity, livelihoods, economic um, timber and non-timber uses, and many other environmental benefits and services. So we haven't really had an overview of Victorian forests so far, but there's 8.2 million across Victoria. About 45% of those are now in uh, national parks or conservation reserves, uh, and about uh, 3.16 million are in multiple use state forests, about 12% of which was actually potentially available and suitable for harvesting. Uh, one, just over a million hectares is privately owned um, and we've got it, Australia's largest plantation area, uh, just over 400,000 hectares. So when we're talking about the future of Victorian forests, what forests we're actually talking about? Are we talking about the whole 8 million? Are we talking about the areas in state forest, as, um, as Ian mentioned? Are we talking about the relatively small area that's been subject to timber harvesting? Uh, over the last 30 years, it's probably been about 150,000 hectares. Are we talking about the area that may have been harvested in the next 10 years, perhaps 30,000 hectares? So that's um, that area that has been harvested or, or that would be is about 4% of the state forest area or 2% of the total area. So for over 95% of the area of forest, not much is going to change unless we decide to do things differently. Uh, just a bit on wood supply. Uh, we extract about 8 million um, cubic metres of wood from Victorian forests. Uh, about half of that comes from softwood plantations, half from uh, Hard, about 2.7 million from hardwood plantations and a smaller amount from our native forests, which has been declining over the last 20 years. So um, you can see there that the area that's coming from hardwood plantations is declining. Uh, it reached a peak in about 2016, 2017, and a lot of that hardwood plantation estate is actually uh, now being converted from plantation back to agriculture. So people who talk about plantations as a solution to our wood supply problems uh, need to recognise that there are some real challenges there. Current estate is going backwards and we haven't really figured out a way to drive investment into new plantations. 
So what are our policy goals? We've got the National Forest Policy Statement, which was um, agreed to by all states and territories, 1992. Relatively straightforward goal to integrate commercial and non-commercial values so that both the material and non-material welfare of the society is improved. While we ensure that the values of forests, both as a resource for commercial use and for conservation, are not lost or degraded. The, uh, we skip ahead 10 years, the Victorian Our Forest, Our Future statement laid it out this way. To achieve in state forests open to commercial timber harvesting, sustainable forests, community confidence in forest management, sustainable timber industry and sustainable re regional communities. So what kind of structure did we end up to try and achieve that? Well, this is our forest management system you know, as of uh, last year. So, if you can make sense of all of this, good luck. Um, but sitting within all of this is uh, an organisation called Vic Forest, who seem to have been associated with much, many of the problems that people have identified. Uh, some would regard them as driving this process, but I regard it more like um, they're a spider, or, sorry, a... Uh, a bug that's been caught in this spider's web where they're, they're just kind of tangled up with all of this legislation. There's 12 different acts or regulatory instruments that covered um, what happens in our forests. We've got um, a highly siloed and um, divided functions for different organisations. Uh, parks uh, manage the conservation estate. We've got a, f a different fire management organisation, Vic's Forest Managing Timber Production, um, and we have... Um, uh, a range of other organisations that are, that are responsible for different purposes like water. So Vic Forest was really developed in a period where we had this kind of overarching, bigger uh, ideology or poli policy agenda, a very powerful policy agenda, informed not by sustainability but by neoliberal political ideology and belief that uh, really force the organisation into making a profit, even though many have pointed to the fact that profit, the profit motive is the problem that we're actually confronting here. So as part of that system, we've had a range of different indicators reported through the State of the Forest Report on sustainability. So we've seen a number of areas improving. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side there, uh, we've got uh, a number of indicators that are declining. And we have a whole lot of areas, as Melissa pointed out, that we've got very little information on. So we're not really sure what's happening. But I'll just point to a couple of those different things. Uh, we've got increased areas of forest in protected areas, and we've got declining forest dis dependent species uh, and increasing threats of climate change, fire, feral animals and weeds. So a lot of those challenges or issues extend right across the different 10 years that forest exists on, and we've got to try and address those things, um, you know, th those declining indicators in those different circumstances. So for all of that, forests have ended up being places of conflict. We've got um, conflict between individuals and their challenges. We've got conflict between different levels of government. And, and, and the governance challenges we have, we've got conflict between institutions over how things should be done. So um, where do we go? One of the uh, kind of benefits, I guess, of having um, lived so long or worked so long in this area is that you end up with an extensive library. So I started pulling out a few of my old books off the bookshelf and I came across this one that um, David, who spoke earlier, and his colleague Jerry Franklin co-authored about 20 years ago. And uh, I think this quote from Jerry in one of his chapters in the book was very apposite. Stakeholders and politicians, all of us here, and from what I've heard today, um, many of the speakers are continuing to fight the battles of the past, pres preservation versus exploitation. By continuing on these old issues, we fail to recognise the changes that are occurring in our forests and the fundamental relationships we have with native forests including the human stewardship necessary to ensure the continued health functioning of these forests. But Jerry um, had a view that he didn't believe that division of temperate forests into fibre farms and reserve 
was likely to achieve the goals we wanted as a society. And the passive approaches to management for many of our native forests, um, and depending on nature to do the job, as many might argue, uh, will lead to unacceptable outcomes. So Jerry was actively promoting um, active forest management. Uh, so the things he mentioned in that paper were reducing fuels, fire and mechanical treatments, protecting resilient older trees, um, responding to environmental change, and you know, I've added assisted migration there through my um, experience in climate change adaptation, managing in insect pests and diseases, and treating young forest stands to accelerate growth towards later successional stages. So Jerry's not been the only voice arguing for this kind of thing. If you read uh, the recent book by Bill Gamage and, and Bruce Pascoe, Bill, uh, sorry, Bruce is arguing that, um, and I went out to look at uh, what he was doing on his property near Wallagrau, and uh, he was arguing that if we burnt judiciously and created a more open forest, fewer, bigger trees, we could get sunlight to the forest for and bring back those old Aboriginal crops. So thinning is his own forest is aiming to provide him with an income, reduce the forest down to you know, about um, 30 trees per hectare that would be those larger, older trees that would dominate the forest system into the future. And I guess uh, Bruce was speculating what we might do if we applied this more widely across the landscape. Similarly, um, David Holmwer, in, um, in his uh, recent paper on bushfire resilient fire care was arguing for similar approaches. Extending indigenous cultural burning, more animals, more in the forest, more native pastures, silver pastoral systems, uh, treating fuels mechanically, rehydrating the landscape through a range of different processes, and using ecologically sensitive thinning and use of wood products for energy, biochar and local building products. So a more recent Indigenous initiative in, in this area is uh, the development of the forest gardening strategy by the Jajarung people, um, the Jara organisation. So they've tried to present this concept of forest gardening to represent their philosophy and practice of managing their landscapes. So much of that country in the, um, the region around Ballarat, Bendigo um, and down to the Murray River is in an overstocked condition from many of the practices that have been deployed in the past, including uh, intensive timber harvesting. Uh, and they're arguing that that can be restored through a process of thinning, reintroducing cultural fire. So they're starting to test that and uh, apply it in the landscape with the aim of reproducing for them what are culturally recognisable forests with abundant plants and animals um, country that's suited for the habitat. Some of the air icon species, kangaroo, ding, dingo, emus, and, 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 and their plant species. So this is not something that's just been cooked up in Australia. In the US, the systems are, these systems have been introduced at a much larger scale through a process called forest landscape restoration. So we talked about suppression earlier today. The US has been very good at suppressing fires over the last 100 years or so. The problem was that the 1% of fires that got away were starting to burn bigger and bigger areas. So they realised that about 15 years ago that they had to change what they were doing. So they've reintroduced this process. Um, people coming together, they've been able to build constructive dialogues between previously warring parties to identify problems, degradation causes in their area and finding solutions that can bring back a balanced mix of goods and services. So um, the US Forest Service and others are investing billions of dollars in treating very large areas through these kinds of processes. And they're seeing that uh, the results giving a structure that leads to greater plant diversity. So Jerry, in, in more recent um, statements, has, uh, hasn't really changed his mind about this. In fact, he's um, doubled down to some extent, and he says sometimes we need open areas and forest if we're going to maximise diversity in our forested landscapes. Sometimes bushes are better than trees, and sometimes logging is the best route to a species-rich landscape. So we've got opportunities to extend thinning more widely. The key challenges are how we decide where it's going to happen, testing it at scale, 
investing in monitoring, adapting and improving the practice, and then how we actually fund it, because it's not going to be fully commercial. And I don't think the public really wants it to be a fully commercial practice. We need to build public support and address concerns that this is going to be about commercial drivers rather than forest health. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip this bit, bit about carbon, but really my argument is that uh, we, we've seen a substantial reduction in timber production in native forest, with the red line showing relatively little impact in a very highly fluctuating uh, natural forest situation. So if we're going to invest in uh, carbon outcomes in our forests, we're much better to invest in establishing new forest areas in, uh, in currently unforested landscapes where we can actually improve timber outcomes, biodiversity and farm trees. So who decides and how? Yeah, and, and these are some of the discussions we've had. Holistic policy goals, um, and this has come out of our work on adaptation, that the key is to get all those different views and voices in the room because everyone sees this problem quite differently. And it's by bringing together that set of different views and voices that we're actually able to get the emergent solutions out of, um, that we might have to many of our problems. As Neil Byron said in a lecture a while ago, um, that uh, many of our, these challenges aren't conducive to black letter law, and we need to be focusing more on the indigenous concept of law, of knowledge and learning by doing. We need new partnerships uh, between those previously warring and arguing bodies, new tenure arrangements, um, more local control so that we're devolving the decisions down to the people who are most directly affected by those decisions. We want more people on country doing things on country and getting to know the landscape in their communities. So one of the opportunities to do this is through um, developing new types of industries. But we're only going to do that if we actually develop a positive vision for forests in Victoria. All we've got at the moment is a negative view of, of our policy arrangements. There's no incentive for anyone who wants to come and invest in forests in Victoria to actually do so because they can probably consider that they're going to walk into a snake pit where um, if they put up a proposal, someone's going to oppose it. So we can have more high value, innovative structural and appearance products being generated from things like native forest thinning, plantation forests and, and farm forests. But the investors will need a clear policy framework, public and policy political support. Um, they'll need clear markets and cash flow associated with that investment and they need a sufficient return that's going to match the risks. So work in that process, we're going to need the capacity of the forestry professionals, all of those, people who worked in Vic Forest, people who worked in other organisations, to support these new industries and protect and enhance the value of Victorian forests. So future prospects, we need to decide where we're going. We need to understand the landscape that we're going into. We need to embrace the uncertainty associated with that landscape and that the environment's going to present to us. Uh, we can enhance the diversity of thinking, species, investors, and keep our management options open, except that we can't save everything and the species and populations are going to fluctuate and change. We want new governance models embracing First Nations and local communities. And we want a comprehensive monitoring, inclusive landscape level experiments and assessments at multiple scales. We want more forward looking projections that can be used to help decision making. But ultimately we want to be living in learning landscapes where people are working together to overcome the challenges through integrated land management. Thanks.